So now we're going to talk a little bit about math. Now, this is the only real talk that I'm going to give that sort of is built around a specific curriculum. Because here, the choice of curriculum kind of directly impacts what we're aiming to achieve. So let me just explain how, why that is. Uh, back in the 1990s, when I first started studying elementary classical education, American students ranked lowest of all the industrialized nations in math, whereas students in Singapore cons consistently produced the most competent math students in the world. Okay, Now, some of you are nodding. You know this. Since that time, there have been studies that sort of compare the Singapore system to the American system, and they found major differences. Among other things, the studies claimed that, quote, Singapore's textbooks build deep understanding of mathematical concepts where traditional U.S. textbooks rarely get beyond definitions and formulas. Now, I started out using American textbooks, and of course, I learned from American textbooks, too. But I quickly experienced what has since been suggested by these studies that too often Americans learn, quote, to mechanically apply mathematical procedures to solve routine problems and are therefore not mathematically competitive with students in other industrialized countries. So I gave Singapore math a try because uh, it had just, there was a, a, a lady from Singapore who was living out on the West Coast who had just started to sort of bring boxes of Singapore math texts across the sea with her in a very informal way. Um, so now in more recent years, the New York Times, CNN, they've been reporting on how more and more American schools are giving this method a try. But you know, back then it was one, you know, one little company that was bringing their books in. Now, it took time to get my brain around the tactics of the method, why it worked. But as I became more familiar with it, I started to see how the Singapore system, how it aims to form the intellect and the memory, two keys to a classical curriculum, not to simply impart the necessary steps to solve the problem. So how does it achieve this? Sort of four, I mean, this is at least my take on this, having taught this for I don't know how many years, taught Singapore math. Um, after having taught from American math textbooks. Four things. First of all, focused content. And I think I have this right here. So the Ratio Studiorum, that 16th century document, that says that um, you want to focus on less material, but you want to master it thoroughly. And that's what Singapore math does. It identifies a sort of a central core of mathematical concepts, unlike most sort of sprawling American text. And now this is a semester worth of math. And look at how skinny this book is, OK? Um, and I don't know if you've seen your, your grade school kids' math textbooks, but they're usually like this, you know? Um, so let's see, where was I? So, so Singapore math, it identifies that core, that core of mathematical concepts. And with this focused but thorough foundation, students can go on to learn additional topics more easily down the road. They don't have to learn it all at once at, at the elementary level. So the second thing is number sense. Singapore math teaches children to internalize a kind of a number sense. And they do this with daily mental math, which trains the intellect. And I'll show you some examples of this. It's really remarkable. Uh, and then number three, reasoning. The students have to sort of reason toward important mathematical properties and even algebraic thinking very, very young before they formulate it into the rules rather than the other way around, which is often how the American texts seem to present it. The method then, too, sort of hand in hand with that is very problem based rather than sort of definition and formula based. And finally, concrete visualization of abstractions. And I don't know if you're really going to understand what I'm talking about. I mean, it, it took, it really did take me a while to sort of see what they were doing and how it was different from what the American textbooks were doing. Singapore math, it just recognizes that children in the grammar stage are wired to learn concrete information. They're not wired to think abstractly yet. And that's, you know, they, they probably didn't have the classical stages of learning, the trivium in mind when they designed this thing. I mean, maybe they did. But what they came up with, the result, it fits in perfectly with the classical, you know, idea of the stages of learning. It's at the grammar stage. Kids are thinking very concretely. They're thinking in terms of facts. They're not reasoning. They're not doing all this abstract thinking. So 
the ability to deal with abstractions, that's something that really develops more in the dialectic stage. So Singapore math, the, the text, it's very visual and concrete. It uses these, now this has sort of become famous. I mean, go, go, go Google the New York Times and the CNN articles and you'll see what I'm saying. It uses these pictorial representations that give students a sort of a mental image of a more abstract concept. Now, you can see from your seats here, this is just some sample pages. You can see that the pages are just filled with pictures. And if I do this, you know, just look at it. It's mostly pictures. It's just very pictorial, OK? Um, so the board, this is just four random pages from grades K through five. And even in the fifth grade, you know, half of what the page, half of what the page is doing is putting pictures. So to see how this works, just consider the following problem. Jack and Jill, they sold their bikes for a total of $380. Jill received 100 more than Jack. So how much did Jack receive? So the kids, the first thing they do is they draw little bars. They know that Jill's, Jill got more than Jack, so they draw it that way, okay? And then they put down what they know, all right? Now that they know that the total here was 380. So this is 380. Now they also know that Jill, that little amount right there, got how much more? 100, okay? So if they lop, if you lop off this 100, that leaves you with this amount right here is 280, right? Now these two amounts are equal. So you just divide them in two. 140, 140, this is 100. Et voila, you know, you can see that Jack got 140 and Jill got 240. Does it match our constraints? Does it add up to 380? Yeah, so I think we're good. Now, um, had we done this algebraically, it would have been completely abstract, okay? Jack would have been X, and you wouldn't be doing this till eighth grade, you know? I mean, this is something, this is in the, this, I don't know, third grade or something you're doing this. I didn't start doing this type of problem until I was in eighth grade pre-algebra, or algebra, whatever it was. Jack is X, Jill is X plus 100, X plus X plus 100 is 380, well, 2X plus 100, you know, blah, blah, blah. You've all done this, I mean, a million times, right? Uh, but you see how abstract that is. Um, this easily understood concrete drawing really is perfectly accessible to kids in the grammar stage. It points to a solution sort of very visually without the formal abstract algebra. And because the student is trained to think algebraically, you know, in a concrete way without the formality of, and the abstraction, the transition to abstract algebra in the dialectic stage, I mean, take it from me, it's actually pretty easy. And this characterizes the entire Singapore math approach. And I had to laugh because this morning as I was preparing this talk, okay, so I wasn't thinking about this in math, but actually I was. Father, he was, he was, sorry. Okay, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. I was thinking about my math talk during your homily. Um, but he was talking about how Jesus uses concrete images, the good shepherd, the sheep. You all heard the reading this morning, right? Jesus uses con concrete images to help us understand abstract ideas. Oh, that's what I was going to say about math. So bet you didn't think I could pull Jesus into a math lesson, did you? <sighs> but, you know, it's the same idea. So it should be noted now for people who are interested in teaching this method, we adults are very comfortable with abstract thinking because we're wired to be at this point. You know, we've, we've been through the dialectic stage. Um, we find it challenging to instruct in the Singapore method with its concrete vis visualizations because we're accustomed to dealing with it abstractly. So in Singapore, they just teachers are intensely trained in this method and they have to be trained not to rely on the abstractions but to be able to visualize the symbols in the way that the kids do. So I don't know. I'm not trying to sell Singapore math. I'm really not. But I just don't know of any other system that teaches this way. Now, it's possible that because Singapore math is just being so intensely scrutinized that now there actually are other systems out there that are doing it too. Uh, but it's compatibility with the classical stages of learning by emphasizing the concrete rather than the abstract in the grammar stage. It's focus on the mastery of fundamentals rather than this huge quantity of concepts. And it's training in mental techniques, which I'm going to show you in a minute, 
That's what makes it ideal for the classical school. And I should make a note, we don't use Singapore math in the upper levels at St. Ambrose, which is tragic, but there's a simple reason. The upper level Singapore sequence, it's very, very different from the American one. Uh, it's brilliant, but it's very different. And students would find it next to impossible to be able to transfer in. We do algebra, geometry, you know, uh, trigonometry, and calculus. Is that what we do? Something like that. And in Singapore, they're grouping concepts together from these sort of isolated subjects, and they're introducing things, you know, all the basic stuff about all those areas, they're introducing your freshman year, and then your sophomore year, you know, they're, every area is getting a little more difficult. It's all interrelated, so it's actually very cool. But transfer students would be impossible. And if we ever get to the point where there are no transfer students, all of our students attend K through 12, I will be tempted to beg Mr. Emil et al. Alia to <laughs> switch over entirely. Uh, and if we become a large enough school, maybe we'll have two tracks, you know, where we've got one group of kids who can do the Singapore track and then the other group who are transferring in and out. Maybe we'll have room to sort of create a process to ease them into Singapore. I don't know. It's, it's just at the grammar stage, it's a lot easier to switch them in and out, but uh, not so much the upper grades. So that's, that's math.